This is going to be the last uh, part of the day, and uh, I will introducing uh, my colleague from ICRICT, Alejandro Rodriguez, head of advocacy at ICRICT, who will present the next panel on taxing wealth. Hello, hello. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you got a good rest in the break, a good coffee. Uh, we are in the last block of, of today's uh, conference, and uh, we saved a good topic for, for, for the last session. Uh, again, my name is Alejandro Rodriguez Jack. Uh, I'm Herb Advocacy at the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. I hope after yesterday's film, more of you can pronounce the, the whole name. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm moderating the, I think one of the hottest topic in taxation at the moment, that is wealth taxation. Uh, in a world of increasing extreme uh, wealth inequality that at the same time translate into extreme inequality of power that put at risk our democracies I think that more and more wealth taxation is seen as a very useful tool to address these major challenges that we are facing. Uh, wealth taxation has a long history of love and hate <laughs> between countries. Uh, sometimes these uh, taxes were very popular at national level. In Europe, they were implemented across a lot of countries. Then. They were dismantled, some with some legitimate, legitimate reasons, some not that much. Uh, but yeah, we have at the moment uh, this topic that uh, interests us a lot. And not only interests us as civil society or academia, we have at this moment discussions both at the national level and in the international level on wealth taxation. We have seen uh, Biden's proposal on wealth taxation in the US on minimum taxation to billionaires, but at the same time at the international level, we had in a couple of weeks before uh, today uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, the G20 discussing world taxation and how to have a coordinated approach. But also in the intergovernmental, intergovernmental uh, negotiations at the UN uh, last month, even countries such as Colombia were mentioning World taxation as a, a, a topic that should be included in the it, framework convention that is currently negotiated. So it is a, it's a very interesting uh, topic that we need uh, to, 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 to flesh out different topics because what we are talking about, what, what are we talking about when we are speaking about world taxation? There are many ways to tax wealth and capital, not only in terms of policy instruments, well, we have different types of policy instruments that this panel will address somehow, but also in terms of approach, which would be the best approach for world taxation? National, a national approach that would lead to a global approach or maybe a global approach that would push the debates, the conversations at the national level. Um, also, which tools a civil society movement are useful to set the agenda and the conversation and the ways on how to debunk myths that in the past worked to, to, to dismantle some of these taxes. And the idea of this panel is precisely to discuss some of these questions. We have papers that speak about inheritance taxation, the evolution of these taxes in two scenarios and which narratives have supported these changes, uh, but also papers on net wealth taxation, a paper on wealth next, uh, net wealth taxation the implementation in Europe and the revenue potentials. Also, there are papers on how to think a coordinated approach for implementing, implementing capital income taxation and inheritance taxation to avoid tax evasion, but also to reconfigure the power of the international economic system, given by differentials of foreign returns and liabilities. And finally, the discussion will bring a fundamental issue uh, when thinking on wealth taxation, and it is transparency of wealth ownership. How to have common rules for beneficial ownership transparency. 
Uh, so this panel and the panelists today are going to, to, to address this. We have two uh, interventions online. So bear with us if for any reason we have a smaller technical issues, but I think everything is figured out. So without further ado, I'm going to present the fir our first panelist, Gaston Nievas. Uh, um, he's going to present the paper, has the exorbitant privilege become a rich world privilege, rates of return and foreign assets from global perspective. Gaston is the national account and statistics coordinator of the World Inequality Lab, and he's also a PhD candidate in Paris School of Economics, conducting research on international political economy. Uh, Gaston, the floor is yours. We have to do something here or something? So, okay. Well, the work I'm presenting today is joint work with Alice Sodano, who's here, and it's not directly about taxation, but it deals with issues of the international financial and monetary system, which I think are very relevant when we are talking also about the global taxation system. And what we're trying to do is to understand the cross-country distribution effects of financial globalization to contribute to this ongoing public debate about the unfairness of the global financial system as posed by Kenyan President William Ruto last year and the ongoing uh, public debate of the unfairness monetary system as uh, criticized by Lula also last year, uh, particularly by the centrality of the US dollar in that system, and which also, the BRICS are trying to contest with a new proposal of the regional currency. But this is not a new complaint, a new complaint and it's not uh, at all a Global South complaint. It used to be a complaint of the rich countries as well. Keynes anticipated the uh, central role of the US in the financial and monetary system. And also, many European countries complained about this in the 60s. But they stopped doing so. And what is that? It's because they also became central in the system and they became privileged in a way. So what we do in particular is we document a bit here with the a bit tall for this. <laughs> we document the winners and losers of financial globalization, studying the whole work to 216 economies from 1970 to 2022, and we focus partic particularly in the rates of return on foreign assets, in the difference between the rates of return on foreign assets and the rates of return on foreign liabilities, a differential return rate that we call the privilege, and we find that. This privilege results in net income uh, transfers for the richest countries of about 1% of the GDP if you look at the top 20 richest, or 2% if you look at the top 10 richest. And I will comment about the other issues in a second. But the main uh, takeaway that is this privilege comes from the fact that these countries can access to cheaper uh, foreign, invest foreign debt. So just to show you the main actors of the world, the main we yeah, have the main developed countries, the US, the Eurozone, and Japan. They're recording a uh, positive return differential, which translates in an uh, income of around 2 or 5% of their GDP, depending on the case. And this is financed by the BRICS, which they, they're ha having a burden of 2 or 3% of their GDP when it comes to this negative return differential. If we group the, the whole world, these 260 economies, in quintiles of na national income per capita, we find that the only ones that are, find, uh, are having a positive return differential are the top 20, the richest countries. They're really the privileged ones. And this return differential is amounting for 1% of their GDP each year as an income, capital income transfer. And this is financed by the rest of the world. So the bottom 80 have to spend 2 or 3% of their GDP each year to finance this uh, differential in debt, in debt return rates. And is deteriorating their position because in order to do so, they have to either record trade surpluses to cover for this uh, foreign capital income differential or get more indebted to finance that. If they get more indebted, then the next period they will have to pay a, a bigger income to the richest countries and it's only amplifying the gap. Uh, so far we could say, okay, we actually, why should we care about this? Maybe the rich world is populated, like they have hundreds of thousands of Warren Buffett people that actually invest in very profitable assets abroad. So that this, they deserve to have this privilege in a way because they're smarter and the bottom 80% of, of the world do not know our portfolio theory. But we will see that this is not the case. These results come actually from the fact, they're not market results, but institutional results. They came from the fact that these rich countries issue the international currencies of the world, which are used in financial transactions, such as imports. Since they're using imports, household demand deposits in these international currencies 
which increases the trade international currencies. And there's like a feedback loop here where trade increases and the global demand for international currency deposit and financial claims also increases. And this increase in the, uh, in the global demand lowers down the borrowing costs for rich countries that issue these international currencies. This means that they pay less on their sovereign debt and this turns into privates also paying less on their external debt, the privates that are based in these countries. So overall, they have a cheaper external debt just because they issue the currencies that they are central in the monetary system. So to conclude quickly, maybe I'm going too fast. Uh, sorry. No, but yes, the old results. But what, what I wanted to highlight, as I said, the countries, the rich countries enjoy a privilege on their net foreign assets because they issue the international reserve currencies and they act as bankers of the world. This results in uh, net income transfers for the top 20, about 1% of their GDP, and uh, for the top 10, or 2%, which alleviates the current account and deteriorates the current account of the rest of the world by about 2 or 3% of their GDP. As I say, they have to record their surpluses or uh, to get more indebted to finance for this, which if they get more indebted, it, it means there is a divergence in the process of uh, foreign capital accumulation. They, the gap keeps amplifying. So what we propose in the paper in order to correct for this is a reform of the international financial system, introducing a clearing system where countries will ta get taxed uh, if they get excess capital income of more of 0.05% of their GDP, which is debatable, could be a bigger or smaller number, uh, but also in the introduction of a global reserve currency that will, could be used in international transactions and could move the equilibrium. This is a bit more complex, but there are still presence of different proposals by Keynes or Stiglitz, for instance. But all of these proposals require the reforming of uh, institutions such as IMF governance, because what we're asking here is for uh, rich countries that are the most powerful ones to stop having a privilege. And they, since the world, as the world is designed right now, they have this almost 70% of the voting power in the IMF, so it's very unlikely they would like to voluntarily renounce to this privilege, since also they, it means that for them it's, they get income from around 1% of their GDP per, per year. This red line right there is almost all of the countries that voted against the UN to, uh, tax convention on November. So we know they're not very keen into getting progressive action. So what we propose also is moving from a system that is actually where voting power gets decided by um, monetary variables such as GDP or trade, but where these rich countries keep contributing more but voting power gets decided by more democratic variables such as the population, environmental, uh, environmental characteristics, or gender equality in the country. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Gaston. I think that this presentation is an innovative approach in terms of taxation. We use, usually when we speak about taxing capital, uh, we use the revenue arguments and this type of discussions, but this shows us, shows us other avenues or other ways that taxation is useful uh, to, uh, and to prevent or to, to cut channels that increase inequality, as you, as you, as you can say, uh, between countries. Uh, okay, so now, uh, I'm introducing Martina Berenica Linartas. Uh, she's going to uh, present the paper, Tax Justice, But How? Lessons from a Historical and Critical Narrative Analysis of the Inheritance Tax in Germany and Mexico. Martina holds a doctorate in political science from the Free University of Berlin and is co-founder of, here we go, Ongleichheit.info, part of the inequality steering, I hope I mentioned it well, part of the inequality steering group of the think tank uh, Forum New Economy. No, Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the honor to present my research findings to you, lessons from a historical and critical narrative analysis of the inheritance tax in Germany and Mexico. The reason why I focus on inheritances can be easily understood by a look on this graph. Already as of today, more than half of all private wealth is not self-generated, but inherited or donated. The consolidation of OCD countries into inheritance societies is in progress. 
This development endangers nothing less than our democracy and environment. However, this trend is not a law of nature. It is a political phenomenon, as we, as we have heard already before, and as such must be solved politically. One potentially powerful instrument to address the consolidation of inheritance societies, and one that gets directly to the root of the problem, is the inheritance tax. Nevertheless, the inheritance tax is highly controversial among the population, generates hardly any tax revenue, and contrary to a progressive design in countries like in Germany, is regressive in its effect. Yet, this has not always been the case. In my paper, I show how the inheritance tax has changed over the last century in Germany and Mexico, within the OECD, to most different systems with the same outcome and Gini levels of around 0 0.8. Yes, that's right, Germany and Mexico, both at the same level of wealth inequality. For both Germany and Mexico, I analyze in detail the changes of the inheritance tax laws. What interested me most, though, were the narratives of political elites. I was able to trace those through the analysis of parliamentary debates, basic intellectual program of the parties, newspaper articles, interviews of important actors, and secondary literature. The endeavor starts for Germany at the birth of the Weimar Republic in 1919, and for Mexico at the end of the Mexican Revolution in 1917. The most important concept has already been mentioned. The focus is on narratives. I analyze narratives in regard to inheritance taxation not only as this realm represents a research gap. What is more, this analysis of narratives allows to show how positions and changes over the course of time have been legitimized. According to Robert Schiller, narratives do not stand alone for themselves, but form constellations based upon the same ideas, values, and norms, so that narratives of the same kind reinforce each other. This way, narrative constellations have more impact than any one narrative. What Schiller calls constellation, unfortunately, without being explicit about the concrete possibility to identify and analyze those, I call repertoire of narratives or the acronym is RUN. Following the criticism that Schiller's concept has received, I have established a new one. The search of the RUN encompasses to identify, qualify, and quantify narratives within a concrete field of interest. Thereby, I identified the strongest, strong, moderate, and weak narratives. Those narratives that are moderate, strong, and the strongest narrative form together the repertoire of narratives. So let us go directly to the results. In both Germany and Mexico, inheritance tax has been strengthened and weakened over the last century. The moral of Germany's history, the inheritance tax can be everything between a fair matter of course to a killer of jobs. In Mexico, the inheritance tax was supposed to ensure more justice in the name of the revolution before it was de facto abolished in 1962 in the name of economic growth. Throughout the analysis, I was primarily interested in two questions. Which runs have succeeded in strengthening inheritance tax, thus constituted the pro-run? And which of the contra-narratives of the contra-run are possibly just political myths that need to be debunked in order to weaken the contra-position in political debates? A comparison of Germany and Mexico shows that it is largely the same narratives in both countries that have formed the run in both the pro and the contra groups. The analysis of the contra narrative shows a weakening always occurred when forms of neoliberalism as an economic paradigm became the hegemon. In Germany, this was the case in the mid 1920s, in the 1950s under auto liberalism followed by neoliberalism from the 1990s onwards, until the present. In Mexico, the so-called retro neoliberalism gained a foothold in the mid-1940s and became hegemonic at the beginning of the 1960s. And et voila, what followed was the abolishment of the inheritance tax in 1962. In these neoliberal phases of one kind or another, the top priority of economic and financial policy is economic growth. The state as an actor should stay out of the economy as much as possible. 
the economic elites are understood as important actors and should not be burdened with high taxes. And taxes in general are framed as, a, as bad for the economy as they would reduce innovation and investment and jeopardize the business location and international competition. Their only function was revenue, nothing more. The weakening of inheritance tax was primarily, primarily legitimized by narratives that focused on the economy and on economic growth. Inheritance tax, so the narrative went, would above all endanger jobs. However, inheritance tax was also strengthened. In Germany in the years 1919 and 1974, as well as in Mexico in 1926 and 1934, these dates alone show that the development of inheritance tax was not directly linked to war or revolutionary events. This is an important insight, as it gives hope that the strengthening is realizable also in times of peace. What was crucial, though, was that within the economic paradigm, priority was given to justice, democracy, and the reduction of existing wealth inequality. The state was the guarantor that tax policy would be designed in the interests of the entire population. Economic elites should, elites should pay their fair share of taxes in accordance to the ability to pay, pay principle. And taxes were an extremely important means of achieving these goals. Their function went beyond revenue. They were understood as important tools to strengthen democracy, social justice, and to reduce inequality. Oops. Inheritance tax was understood accordingly. It was intended to serve. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Uh, it was intended to serve the purpose of tackling inequality by birth and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. What is more important, or is important, at no time was the inheritance tax reform single handedly. It was an expression of a social and democratic understanding of taxes as a whole. And at present, well, whether we like it or not, neoliberalism is still setting the tone. But as the critical analysis of the contra run reveals, most circulating contra and neoliberal narratives lack empirical evidence and need to be demystified in terms of a long-standing communication strategy. In my paper, I critically touched upon endangered jobs, special treatment of business assets, and ownership principle. In order for neoliberalism to be overcome, a better alternative to the circulating narratives must be presented. Regarding the communication, their legitimization, the question is, which lessons can we draw from the historical analysis of the effective pro-run as to strengthen the inheritance tax and to reduce inequality? What is it that we need? First, the alternative must be expressed in the form of narratives that are based on the same ideas, values, and norms. They have to be congruent. Second, the run should not be too broad. Narrow runs have been more effective in the past. Third, it is important, crucial, not to adopt neoliberal pr uh, premises. This may sound obvious, but if you take a look at current debate on taxes, you come to realize it is not. One such neoliberal narrative is still the very common one that a tax is good or bad for the economy. This is a neoliberal frame. Fourth, and in this meaning, the storyline of all these narratives of a new paradigm must be bigger. The runs of the past give good guidance. It should be about justice, about democracy, about reducing inequality, and fifth, in accordance of the challenges and historical interdependencies and responsibilities for our current crises. It should be about climate too. We are, to use the words of Matthias Erzberger, Vice Chancellor and Minister of Finance of the Weimar Republic in 1919, in dire need of high and progressive taxes on inheritances and gifts. However, not due to any economic considerations, but because reducing wealth inequality is a prerequisite for democracy and climate justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. I think that uh, your paper and the presentation is very helpful. We have here in the room a lot of campaigners and civil society movements.
that are looking for uh, pushing wealth taxes, both at the national and international level. And I think that this analysis of narratives is very, very useful just to, to bring ideas, new ideas on how to approach these new discussions and debates that are forthcoming. So thank you for your presentation. Now we are turning to our online speakers. Um, we have Domenico Imparato, who is going to present us a, a paper called A UN Tax Pillar to Address Capital Concentration and Wealth Flight. Uh, Domenico is an EU Marie Sudowska Curie Postdoctoral Global Fellow at the University of Hamburg, Institute of Law and Economics, and the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Domenico, are you with us? Good afternoon. Um, my paper um, is about capital concentration and the correlation between capital concentration and wealth inequality and tax policy to address this, um, these issues is. Uh, the first point is um, when it comes to capital concentration, how much many companies, including public companies, are being controlled. Uh, for ex um, in my paper, I track, for example, 150 companies, um, public companies, blue chip companies, uh, especially because corporate control and capital concentration brings money and political power. The more capital that you control into a company, the more dividends shared by banks and interest you can get in return. And also this can also bring um, can also bring um, political control, political influence. And to give an example, excluding financial institutions like bank and state-owned companies, on the DAX 40, which is the blue index, the blue chip index in Germany, 34% of the top 40 German companies are being controlled by few families. Uh, in Italy, it is very similar. It is for, it's even more, it's 46% of the top uh, 40 Italian public companies are subject to control by a few individuals. And uh, in Sweden, the top among the 30 top public companies uh, listed on this week's stock, Swedish stock exchange, 44 are being controlled by few families. And the numbers are not different either when it comes to the DAC 40, the blue index for French listed companies, 37% out of their 40s are being subject to control by few families. Um, the situation is very similar even when it comes to corporate equity without specifically looking at um, the big public companies. Um, for example, in Germany, the top 10% um, owns around 60% of the German net wealth. So they own 60% of the net wealth in the German economy. Uh, in the US, this is even bigger. For example, the 10% of Americans, the top 10%, owns 92% of shares into the US public companies. In other words, the top, the top 20 owns 13 times as much corporate equity as the bottom um, 60. And if we look um, across the world, this is not better. Um, a study from 2020 from the OECD shows, for example, that 9% of globally listed equity is being controlled by few strategic individuals and families. But on top of that, 11% of global listed equity are held by private companies and holding, and, holding, and holding companies. Now, since companies are just legal structures behind which it's very likely that there are rich individuals, it's conceivable to say that around 20% of listed equity globally is held, is concentrated in the hands of a few strategic shareholders and individuals and families. Um, so what are the consequences? Um, if given these numbers and the stake uh, and, and the size of corporate and capital concentration, it's not surprising that according to some newspapers, it's very likely that the world will see its first trillionaire over the next 10 years. At the same time, according to UBS as Swiss Bank, in 2023, there were more new billionaires that uh, got the acquired greater wealth through inheritance than by working, than by being entrepreneurs, basically. 
And indeed, it's expected, especially in the US, the 1,000 billion, but also across the world, that 1,000 billionaires will pass on more than 5 trillions to their heads over the next 20, 30 years. And numbers, the inheritance economy, for example, expected to be in the UK over the next 30 years is also very big in the terms of trillion. So uh, the question is, if all this uh, wealth transfer will pass on and these transfers will benefit, will benefit uh, A, from wealthy family, what the consequences can be. Um, in one world, in my view, the consequence can be an eritocracy. The system, the economy can turn into, in, can turn into an eritocracy per se. Um, there might be three potential tax strategies to deal with this risk. Um, the first one is to, in my view, is to work on making the income tax system more progressive. Uh, this is easy to do, but at the same time, an income tax system by definition targets income only and not the accumulation of wealth and capital and assets. Another solution could be to um, have an annual wealth tax, which is good because uh, it would be independent from the rate on, from the return on capital. But at the same time, a wealth tax needs um, assessment on the value of the assets that everyone owns, I mean, that the rich owns every 12 months. And at the same time, it may skew investments towards um, old companies over riskier and young firms. So that's a risk with a wealth tax. On the other side, we can work on, on an inheritance tax. And this can act as a break on all these wealth transfer passing on to the uh, to the heirs of wealthy families, but at the same time with the inheritance tax, we do have to wait until someone dies before being able to impose a wealth an inheritance tax. That's, um, and so the next question is, since in my paper, I specifically say that we should be working indeed on inheritance tax. My next question is, are inheritance taxes in good shape across Europe, for example? In Sweden, like Sweden abolished its inheritance tax, for example, in 2005, um, the UK is a country where inheritance tax still exists and tax rates can be very high. They can vary between 0% and 40%. But the real, the real issue is that the system provides for business property relief. So depending on whether you receive, for example, shares from which are either listed or unlisted, your business property relief can be between 15 and 100%, in which in, in the latter case, basically your tax rate will go down to zero because you will get a 100% business property leave, relief. In Germany, inheritance tax rates are even higher than in the UK, between seven and 50%, but same story as in the United Kingdom. You can get very easily business property relief, especially if you're rich and you own a business, you can get business property relief quite easily, and that business property relief would be between 85 and 100% of whatever tax rates you, you would, you, you would super, supposed to pay. Um, and in Italy, inheritance tax are lower than in Germany in the UK, between 4 and 8%, but same issue as above. That is, it's very easy to get business property relief and pay zero. Um, so the answer to this question, in my view, is no. Inheritance tax are not in good shape in Europe, even though formally on the paper they exist. Um, so my proposal in the paper is that similar to what the OECD has been doing with corporation, corporations, we should be working on a UN at the European national level. We should be working on a framework convention to set the minimum standard, the, inter, the, the, the principles of future international tax cooperation. Within this framework, a specific protocol could be signed and that specific protocol could ask states to implement global minimum inheritance tax rates. In my paper, for example, I mean, these are debatable, but just to give an example, the minimum tax rates on inheritance day could be 15% over wealth transfer above some threshold, like 15 million, and then a second tax rate of, for example, 25 when the wealth being transmitted gets it's even higher, for example, higher than 750 million. Um, there is one problem though, and the problem is that the ultra wealthy, even if they were forced to pay inheritance tax, they could avoid doing that by relocating because the ultra wealthy are very mobile. Uh, 
is something which is happening indeed across the world. For example, according to the Financial Times and the Guardian, in just in 2020, more than 30 billionaires and millionaires left Norway to relocate to Switzerland and other countries because they didn't like increases in the Norwegian wealth tax. And the same happened happened also uh, over the past 20 years in the US because in 2001, there was a big change in um, in um, estate taxes in the US and according to some studies, 20% of the top 400 richest Americans, they simply relocate, they move uh, to another place. So one solution to try, this is something that we can call wealth flight, people ultra wealthy moving away and relocating. Uh, one solution to this is to implement what the US has been doing uh, uh, recent, like in 2008, which is called expatri expatriation tax. It has some upsides, like it targets only wealthy and high earners upon leaving, upon expatriating, upon leaving the US. It, it applies on a crew, even though our realized gains at their fair market value at the time that these people leave. And it allows for the federal election if you don't have the immediate liquidity to pay for this tax. And, um, but there are also downsides. Uh, it's based on citizenship rather than a residency, which is can give rise to technical problems. It applies unnecessarily to real property assets. It does not account for post-exit decreases in value. So for decreases in value that happen after you leave the country. And if you do want to get the deferral, if you do want to defer your payment, you do have to wait, do have to waive any rights that you might be having under any double tax treaty that the US Congress has ever signed, which is an issue for uh, tax co uh, coordination and cooperation across jurisdictions. So in this sense, the same UN, UN framework can uh, list uh, the fight of wealth flight as one of its goals goals and the protocol can provide for can ask states to implement um, minimum global exit tax um, that would apply at the same thresholds already uh, uh, um, already established for the inheritance tax so for example the same threshold 50 million could, could trigger both could could, uh, could trigger both an inheritance tax or if you live before dying could trigger the same could could also trigger a minimum exit tax, um, and it should be about we should be avoiding by the way the downsides of the U.S. expatriation tax in designing this global minimum exit tax. Uh, the next question though is whether like a federation or a quasi federation as the European Union can ever implement an exit tax on individuals, because there are many principles in Europe and it's not very easy like to harmonize taxes across the European Union. Especially when it comes to taxing individuals, Article 49 of, of the European uh, Treaty, uh, the freedom of establishment, is very important. But I do believe that there is legal room for the European Union to have such a tax, especially by looking at Article 5 of the ANTA Directive, which is already done so for corporations, and also by looking at some theories that could justify the use of European powers to implement exit tax on individuals at the European level. Uh, just to conclude, if the Euro European Union was ever to do that, like introducing a well um, an exit tax on individuals at the European level, we should be distinguishing between whether the relocation is from a European country to another European country, for example, from France to Luxembourg, just to give an example. And in that case, we should provide for the federal of payment interest-free exit feature and accounting for post-exit losses or so decrease in value. But while if the relocation happens to be from a European member state to a non-member state or a third country, we should be draw a line between whether that third country is a tax cooperative. In that case, should the federal should, should still be free of interest, but and collaterals. Uh, could be asked only on a case by case when there is a risk of no recovery. Whereas if the relocation is, a is to a third country, which is non-tax cooperative, at that point, we should always ask for and impose conditions to grant a deferral because a non-tax cooperative by definition is a country where we cannot be sure that we can go after someone moving there and recover any assets. 
And that's my proposal. So thanks for your, for your attention and please let me know for any follow-up question. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Domenico. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, to see proposals now on, on, on these approaches, uh, coordinated approaches on inheritance taxation of uh, uh, a global minimum inheritance tax, also an approach coordinated approach on exit taxes, something that also Professor Sukman mentioned this, this morning in, in, in his intervention. So this is very exciting to see how, to start envisioning how this coordinated approach under a UN process and a UN framework convention could look like. That is precisely what we are doing here, trying to envision what, what, what we can do uh, in terms of fitting into what is being negotiated at the moment. Um, okay, I'm going to pass the word now to Andres Nobel, Nobel. Uh, he's going to present his paper, Draft Beneficial Ownership Standard for a Protocol to the UN Tax Convention. Andres is lead researcher beneficial ownership for the Tax Justice Network. His work focuses on beneficial ownership, offshore trust, and automatic exchange of banking information. Uh, Andres, if you can hear me, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I think it makes great sense to have this presentation based on the previous ones. Just because if you really, if we really want to get an inheritance tax, an EU exit tax, or any other sort of wealth tax, we do need to make sure that there is enough transparency to be able to implement these taxes. Just of an anecdote, uh, a few years ago, I did some research for eCrypt, where I was looking into the UK asset registries. So the UK has a pretty good form for inheritance tax, where you have to report all types of assets. But now when looking into the information on asset ownership that the UK has, it's very little. So we can see this in the case of the UK, that all of these inheritance taxes are based on self-declarations. So the idea with this presentation and with this uh, protocol for a BO standard uh, to the UN tax convention that I worked together with Gonzalo, is to really ensure that globally we will have enough transparency so that we can eventually and effectively um, levy and impose taxes on the wealth on individuals, because most of these wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, do apply on the individuals and their assets that we know of. So just very briefly, um, there's this concept of beneficial ownership. Of course, people, not only criminals who want to engage in money laundering or corruption, also high net worth individuals who do not want to pay taxes, especially wealth taxes, will try to hide their identity and their assets. So they will try to use secretive assets like gold or art or crypto, but if they use bank accounts or real estate that are actually registered, they will use two more strategies. One involves hiding behind many corporate layers uh, from trust to anstalts to companies and then distributing these throughout the world. So there is really a need for global cooperation to ensure that we have transparency of all, all of these to be sure that then we can impose the inheritance tax or the wealth tax. Uh, so of course, beneficial ownership has to do a lot with wealth tax, inheritance tax or gift tax, but also with personal income tax or capital gains tax, as well as dividend tax. So this idea is to have already a protocol or a draft protocol for the UN tax convention, so as to make sure that all countries will really implement and, and ensure the same transparency levels. There are some procedural issues that we have to define, I guess, once we have a protocol. For instance, do we allow for reservations where countries decide not to implement some part of the protocol or just to give a different interpretation? Ideally, we should not allow for any reservations. There's a question of the minimum number of countries that need to sign or adhere to this protocol before it enters into force. Sometimes it's about 23 countries. We might think of a lower one. And then the question is how ambitious this protocol or this beneficial ownership transparency policy should be. Ideally, it would be the most ambitious case. That's the one that we prepared. But we know that it's also, it will be a challenge. I mean, countries many times don't want to um, impose on themselves um, much transparency. So this protocol is based on the Tax Justice Network's Roadmap to Effective Beneficial Ownership Transparency, Rebot, which covers collecting of information, of course, having a registry, effects of registration, the scope of legal vehicles, conditions that trigger registration, exceptions from registration, the beneficial ownership definition, timing of registration, the details of the beneficial owner to be registered, who can access or who should access information, exceptions from access, verification, sanctions, and then two more Quite relevant functions. One is these mandatory disclosure rules to have enablers disclose avoidance schemes. And then, of course, the interconnection between beneficial ownership registries and asset registries 
so as to have asset uh, registration or a global asset registry eventually. So very briefly to cover all the points, uh, in black is what's already happening. Anything that's in blue is what hardly any country is doing or maybe no country at all, but we should really achieve to, to, get, to get this to be effective. So collection of information should be on a one-stop system, ideally one central registry for the whole country, but for federal countries like Argentina, Switzerland, or the US, which will have sub-national registries, we should still ensure there's interconnection. The crucial point, which doesn't happen in any country or almost in any country, is to give constitutive effects. This is a civil law concept, which means that rights, such as the rights to dividends, to vote, or anything, even to the protection of private property, only start upon registration. If you don't register a trust, if you don't register a company, then you should have no benefits of limited liability or even, again, the protection of private property. The scope is that it should cover all legal vehicles, companies, legal persons, partnerships, trust, regardless if they have separate legal personality. This is relevant in the UK when we think of limited partnerships that don't have separate personality, and that's why they are not covered by the BO register. Triggers, they should of course cover any local company based on corporation, but also any foreign legal vehicle that has either local assets or operations or that has any participant, a local beneficial owner, a local shareholder, a director, etc. Exceptions, of course, there should be none. Um, the only case where we find an exception is acceptable is it's for redundancy. If the same information is already available with the same level of access, then of course we don't need to register that again as long as we know exactly where the information is and we can get it just as well. The definition of the beneficial owner should cover any natural person or all natural persons that have either direct or indirect ownership control or benefit. And here the important thing is to apply no thresholds because that's one of the easiest way to circumvent and avoid being identified. Argentina already does this and covering not just equity, like shareholdings, but also debt, or exposure to the political or financial benefits of a company through financial instruments like options, futures, or any of the sort. The US proposes to cover these, and especially anyone with a power of attorney to either control the company or its bank account or any of the assets. The timing of when to register, upon corporation, and upon any change, as well as annually, just to confirm that everything is, uh, nothing has changed. The details are the usual ones to identify the beneficial owner, name, address, date of birth, tax identification number. But the crucial things that we need to start asking for that hardly anyone asks is for the full ownership chain, the status as a political exposed person that gives a high corruption risk, the source of the money or the reason why someone is a beneficial owner, such as I just bought 100 shares from this person for $100, the tax residencies, again, for golden visas, which might also be relevant for um, all of these exit taxes, um, the civil status for spouse and offspring to ensure that they don't really use their family as nominees. Access, of course, we want this to be public, free, and online. Although, of course, for privacy and data protection, we would accept case by cases of exceptions when there is a proven risk for someone's life or integrity. The verification. Um, this is another crucial point that we know of, thanks to the UK having a public bio register and global witness checking how how bad it was is that we need online validation, pre-filling of information, automatic cross-checks, discrepancy reporting. Many of these exist more or less in different countries. What doesn't exist yet in many countries is red flagging based on the ownership structure, looking how complex or simple an ownership structure is, and especially the profile of the beneficial owner. Basically, where do they live, how much assets they have declared, what's the income declared, to prevent cases where nominees are exploited and someone is just offered $100 to sign documents and then appearing as owning hundreds of companies that are maybe involved in procurement. And then for sanctions, to prevent incorporation uh, of any company or trust that fails to provide beneficial ownership data, and importantly, to prevent also transactions with any obliged entity so that they cannot even open a bank account or transfer money, or to with any registered asset, like not to dispose or purchase real estate, to suspend their tax identification number, and again, to prevent voting or dividends uh, for any beneficial owner who fails to declare this. And then the last two points, again, even if we get everything right, there will be enablers disclosing or designing avoidance schemes. And that is why it's so relevant for all countries to have these mandatory disclosure rules where lawyers, service providers, accountants, and any other enabler and taxpayers have to report the schemes that they are using to hide the beneficial owner. 
BIPs Action 12 requires some of these, the OECD uh, mandatory disclosure rules for avoidance of the CRS, the Total Bank Exchange of Information System has this, DAC6 has this, so again, it's not that revolutionary to ask this, but this hasn't really uh, been implemented in the global south. And then of course, the last point to really make beneficial ownership transparency work for wealth tax, inheritance tax, direct wealth tax, like in Argentina or any exit tax, is that we need to interconnect these hopefully very effective beneficial ownership registries where they, we really know who are the individuals owning the companies or the trusts or the partnerships with the assets that these partnerships, trusts or companies actually hold. So this can be the real estate registry, the vessel registry, the uh, aircraft and every other registry. And of course, we will need to start coming up with new registries for those cases of, of assets like artworks or precious metals that don't yet have to be registered. And then I ensure we can really have the effective transparency so that once we have this wealth tax applied worldwide, either through a UN tax convention or through national measures, we can, and authorities can ensure that they have the information to enforce and ensure compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andres, as well. Uh, he addresses one key issue if, you are, if we are thinking about the effectiveness of wealth taxation uh, and the feasibility of it yeah, and its transparency of ownership. So, uh, and it is important again to, to, to address or think how we would address this in a coordinated approach. So it's very, very useful as well, this type of, of conversations. Uh, last but not least, um, I'm going to give the floor to Alison Schultz. She is going to present as the paper Taxing Stream Wealth, how much countries around the world could gain from progressive wealth tax. Uh, Alison is a research fellow at the Tax Justice Network and holds a PhD in finance from the University of Mannheim. Alison. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And maybe uh, to say that beforehand, I think this paper is slightly different from the previous paper because what we are doing here is not so much an in-depth analysis of, of structures or what we've seen before, but we see it more as a resource which can be used by people who want to push for net wealth taxes in their countries. And in order to have this resource, we basically do, do two things. First, we provide estimates what countries around the world could gain from progressive wealth taxes. And second, we kind of assemble the evidence which is there out there on debunking myths for wealth taxes and also on the general experiences and learnings we have made with net wealth taxes around the world. This is quite connected to the previous papers, I think, because we're actually mainly basing all this analysis on data from the World Inequality Lab, on the World Inequality Database, which is an amazing database, I think. So we're very much grateful to your work on this. And I think we can also maybe a little contribute to what you said we should be doing, Martina, that we should actually be linking the benefits of a net wealth tax to the big issues, especially of climate. So what we try to do in the report, if you want to check out later as well, we try to show how much each country could actually recover in order to fight climate change, in order fight, to fight the climate crisis, in order to be well-equipped in their health and education systems with using taxes on net wealth. Okay, there was a lot of, I said a lot before now, so this is the paper Taxing Extreme Wealth, what countries around the world could gain from progressive wealth taxes. So why should we tax extreme wealth? First reason, we actually need the money. So the annual financing needs to fight climate change and to finance the sustainable development goals are estimated to be at a global scale of 4 trillion US dollars. This is a number from the Jungta Trade and Development Report 2023. And of course, we could also somehow get part of this money by cutting expensive and increasing debt levels, but these are inferior solutions given the already underfunded public budgets and also given high debt levels in several countries. Second reason we absolutely need to fight inequalities, and I think we've all listened to Martina here, so inequality destroys social cohesion, it undermines trust in democratic systems and thereby facilitates authoritarian regimes, which is actually a concern 
which has been raised by many, including Undesa in 2020 and 2020. So maybe what is the cool thing about a net wealth tax when we want to fight inequality? The cool thing about a net wealth tax is that wealth inequality is such so much overlapping with other inequalities. To give some examples, men possess on average 50% more wealth than women. And this also translates into a tax and justice issues because given that women and racialized minorities have less wealth, they need to rely primarily on labor income, which is then taxed at higher rates and makes them contribute more to public budgets. Finally, and this is something which um, Gabriel Sukman has explained this morning, we need to restore progressivity in our tax system as we see that existing progressive income tax system are actually unable to deal with income from extreme levels of wealth. Okay, given that we kind of agree that we should tax extreme wealth, what do we even mean when I say extreme wealth? So which wealth are we talking about here? In our study, we take wealth of the richest 0.5% in each country. And if you look at these, peop at these people or at these individuals based on the great data we have, is that these richest 0.5% of the population in the countries we analyze possess more than 25% of a society's total wealth and Importantly, they can realize this disproportionately high returns on their wealth. So the paper I'm citing here shows that if you're among the richest individuals, your returns on wealth, so your return on investment, will be 18 percentage points higher than the returns on investment of average people like us. So they can actually realize these disproportionately high returns, and as a result, they have seen their fortunes grow 2.7 fold over the past 25 years, when most of the other part of the societies have not increased their wealth if they have wealth at all. Then, and this is also something which has been mentioned previously, they pay lower taxes on their income compared to the average taxpayer, basically because they have many unrealized capital gains, which are then non-taxed, and they can use all kinds of complicated structures, which has also been addressed in previous talks. Then, and this is relating this back to the climate crisis, and I don't have numbers for the richest 0.5%, but for the richest 1%, thanks to colleagues from Oxfam in this room. So the richest 1% of the world emit as much CO2 as two-thirds of the world. So it kind of seems fair that they contribute a little more to the fight of climate change, or at least as much as the rest of us does. Coming to the question on how to tax extreme wealth, of course, there are tons of papers on this. I'm just summarizing the three key insights which we saw from existing papers and also from lessons from history. The first one is to tax net wealth about a very high, above a very high threshold. So we should really make sure that we're not taxing property on the middle, middle income people, or on the middle wealth people, but we should set the threshold very, very high and then only tax net wealth exceeding the threshold. What do I mean by net wealth? Net wealth is the assets of a person minus the liabilities of a person. So let's assume, which would be nice, if I have a house of 5 million euros, but I'm still paying back a credit of 2 million euros, then my net wealth is 3 million euros. So we would only tax net wealth above the, thre above the threshold. And I've talked about the threshold before with the 0.5%. And what is important here, that even from these very, very rich people who are part of the top 0.5%, we would not be taxing their entire wealth. We would only be taxing the part of the wealth which made them pass the threshold. So let's say I'm part of the 0.5% and the threshold is at 10 millions to be part of these 0.5%, then only the wealth I have above the 10 millions would be taxed. Second uh, important rule, do not exempt any asset class. This has been done a lot in the past that people are like, yeah, we should not tax business wealth, we should not tax artwork because we want to protect art, blah, blah, blah. So we have a very big, exem big exemption here because people can own whatever they want below this threshold. So they can own a lot of any asset class they like. However, as soon as they exceed this threshold, we should not exempt asset classes because this will just induce people to shuffle around their wealth, to use substitutes, and to make enforcement very, very difficult. Third 
uh, rule, and I can save some time here because Andres has explained all of this, we should ensure full beneficial ownership transparency to uh, incorporate a net wealth tax. And if we cannot fully implement that, we should really try our best to have that and also exchange it among countries in the best reason, uh, in the best case, um, in a global asset registry. Okay, so, oh, so now um, coming to the analysis we're doing here, I already told you that we use data from the World Inequality Lab, thank you, and we're kind of applying a national tax on net wealth where we apply a system which has been implemented recently. So again, with ideas from other partners who are in this room, we just decided to follow a model which has been proposed by the Spanish parliament in the end of 22. And in this model, you don't need to see all details here. The relevant part here is only that we have like three bins. We have people who are above the 0.5% thresholds. Those are taxed at 1.7% on the wealth above this threshold. Threshold. We have people above the top 0.1% threshold, and we will be taxing this part of wealth at 2.1%. And we have people above the 0.05% threshold, and those will be taxed at 3.5% on their wealth. The important part of this slide is only that this is super moderate. These tax rates are super low, especially given how much you can realize gains in these wealth brackets. So what do we have to gain? Uh, what do we have to gain here? You see the wealth tax revenues in million US dollars for different countries of the world. What we do is we deduct existing wealth revenues. So actually this is already accounting for existing revenues. And you see that with very few exceptions for those countries who have already quite strong wealth taxes imposed, we see quite high revenues of wealth taxes ranging from 100 to 500 million US dollars per year for several African countries up to nearly 500 billion US dollars per year for, for China or 650 billion dollars per year for the US. We also see, oh, if we take all of this together, we get a revenue of 1.9 trillion US dollar. And you see that this would be already half to finance what we need to fight climate crisis, the climate crisis, and what we would need to finance all the sustainable development goals. If we now express this as a percentage of tax revenues, we see that for most of the countries, we don't have the correct data or the comparable data here for all the countries. Most countries could expand their tax revenues between two to five and up to even more than 20%. On average, the countries would expand their revenues in a, a level of 6.13%. Is it a lot now? Maybe just to give some numbers before I come to the last slide, before the timekeeper is uh, stopping me here. So just to put this in comparison, I've put out some of the numbers. We are in France here. So if you look at France, we see that the revenue which would be generated by France is three times the amount which France hopes to get back from the pension reforms. So with this very moderate taxes on net wealth, you could generate every year three times the amount which they hope to get from the pension reform. If we go to India, where we don't have um, if data on this map, they could expand the government health spending by 73% with this tax on net wealth. If you look at Malawi, they also don't have the, um, the um, percentage here on the map. They could expand government health spending by a third. And we see very similar numbers for many, many of the countries which do not have net wealth taxes here. So thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, of course, uh, seeing the revenue potentials of, of the implementation of wealth net taxes that are where taxes that have not been discussed in the panel previously, it's very important because uh, follow the money, you know, uh, and 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 it is important to to keep in mind the cost of opportunity of not implementing this type of of the opportunity cost of not imp implementing this type of of policy fiscal policy instrument. So very useful as well. Uh, well, after the presentations, uh, we also, all, all also uh, as previous panels, we are going to have a Q&A with the public. So I ask uh, if you could think uh, some questions that you would like to ask to our panelists. But before that, I would like to have some follow-up questions. 
uh, to, to our panelists. Uh, the questions were thought individually to each one, but of course, if you can chip in, you want to chip in on these topics, please, uh, please do it. Uh, the idea is to have the, a conversation here with, our, with us. So I'm going to start with, with Gaston. Uh, so I, I would like to, to ask you, so your presentation, one of the, of the proposals for, for, for addressing these gaps of foreign returns assets, as returns and liabilities uh, is, a, is a tax. Which type of tax do you imagine or do you think would be the most appropriate in terms uh, for, for, for addressing this issue uh, and why? Uh, could, could you explain a little bit more on, on what you were thinking in terms of which fiscal policy tool would, or instrument would, would help us with these things? Yeah, voilà. it works perfect. Uh, yes, yeah, actually quite simple. Uh, simply at the end of the year, you compute how much of the uh, capital income countries are due to this excess return differential. And if it's above 0.05% of their GDP, you tax completely that and you put in a development fund that will serve climate change issues or development issues or poverty alleviation issues in the global south. So the tax is actually super simple. Whenever it's about that, you get all for the for the development fund. But I think the key there is the institutional the, the institutional design that will actually regulate that, collect the tax, and then decide what where is it spent. Uh, ideally, the IMF should serve those purposes. Purposes they actually record. Uh, the balance of payment of countries every year, so they have the infrastructure. But if, if it's controlled by the Global North uh, and the Global South has not uh, saying in the table, as we saw, it's impossible that that will happen. So I think the key issue is not the, the design specifically of the tax, but the political economy of how countries will actually implement this. Okay, thank you, Gaston. And I think that this uh, helps me to link with my next question that is for Martina. So uh, as I mentioned previously, you mentioned this analysis of narratives is very important uh, when, when we want to analyze the political economy on how to, to, to do successful tax reforms at the national and international level. Uh, your paper analyzes the narratives used for successful tax reforms from the perspective of strengthening inheritance taxes or from the perspective of weakening uh, inheritance taxes. But again, narratives used or helpful for successful, successful ta tax reforms. So now that we are ahead or looking forward to negotiations at the international level uh, within the UN on, on this type of, of proposals, but also at the national level in different countries, which type of narratives do you, can you identify at the moment that are surging? Can you anticipate that will surge? And maybe, although I think it's a difficult question, which type of narratives do you think would be successful for the tax justice movement to start implementing, to start campaigning in favor of, of this type of, of taxes? I think if you think strateg strategically about it, um, what will the contract group tell you? The narratives that they will put on the table will be endangerment of jobs, economic growth. So the narratives from the prayer groups for strengthening any kind of a wealth tax have to be bigger. We have to to tell like big stories about big questions. And this is in the first place democracy. And second, it is uh, climate justice. So really not to speak about like, yeah, and then we will actually somehow create jobs. I, I have to say that um, if we play by their rules, by neoliberal frames, we will definitely lose. So we have to think paradigmatically, um, bring something new on. So like really speak of the big justice questions and uh, or big justice uh, in general. And, and bring those forward. So if they come with jobs, we speak of, uh, yeah, and what about democracy? I mean, who is, who is winning them? Or especially like when, uh, when analyzing the inheritance tax, the contract group is speaking of uh, middle business and family. If I then speak of, yeah, but I want to have higher revenues, people in the public will just listen to me and like, okay, so there's one team speaking about revenue, the others about jobs. I think my job is more important to myself than any further revenues they could somehow other by, by another tax also get. So this is what I mean by we have to tell like big narratives, big stories. Thank you very much, uh, Martina. I'm going to try a question with our online panelists. I don't know if they are hearing me at the moment. I, I want to speak a bit uh, about challenges for, for this uh, a 
common approach of beneficial ownership standards uh, to Andres specifically. So which are the main challenges at the national level to reach universal standards for reporting beneficial ownership and exchange of this information? I think this is another important topic and is which, which could be the, the, the challenges at the national level to prepare information for this to be exchanged with other jurisdictions in order for, 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 for cooperation, for making taxes more effective. Uh, so I don't know if you can see some of the challenges that are currently uh, facing countries in terms of implementing the beneficial ownerships, uh, beneficial ownership registries at the national level, or which challenges do you foresee that will arise from this? Um, thank you. I would say the main challenge is really political. I mean, there are plenty of standards. They don't always say the same, although they are merging in a way. But I would say that countries don't really see the pressure to do it. I mean, where I see that most countries do things about beneficiary transparency is because they feel the pressure, either from the EU uh, approving a directive, or when there is the Global Forum or FADA or any other international organization or the IMF putting pressure on countries. And I think the reason for that is that many times beneficial ownership is perceived more of an anti-corruption, anti-money laundering measure, which again, countries might say they're against, but they're not necessarily as much against. And it's not perceived like this revenue mobilization side. I mean, like all the extra taxes and all the extra tax revenues, especially through wealth tax, that a country could be getting through beneficial ownership. They, I feel like they don't see this. Even the Global Forum pushes more about exchange of information. So having beneficial ownership in case another country asks you for it, but not for you as a country to really see the benefit of having that. So I feel like that's one where I think that we need to be keep working on changing the narrative and really show how bio transparency can help the country raise more revenues, especially if this comes along with new wealth taxes. And then trying to really have more a universal or maybe just one standard that really will apply to everyone. Um, currently, there are different ones. and, and they don't really say what to do. They just give you principles and say like maybe 25%, but you can go lower, maybe this, but you can also do that. And I feel like that's why we have a lot of inconsistency. But I don't think the biggest problem is the inconsistency, but rather the fact that many countries are still failing to see the value need, take ownership. And that's why they just do the minimum, not to be in a way uh, put it in some blacklist or gray list uh, instead of really seeing the benefit of that. Thank you, Andres. Uh, uh I'm glad that you can hear me, so I think that Domenico can also. Uh, Domenico, I wanted to to ask you something about in your presentation. You you pro, you put a kind of a pros and cons of different type of of of, of taxes uh, to to tax wealth and capital income, and indeed there are different uh, policy tools for 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 doing this. Uh, inheritance taxes, capital gain taxes, even taxes, net wealth taxation. Uh, are these measures complementary or rather exclusive to each other? Uh, and let's think this at the national level for the purpose of the question. And, if, and if, he, if there is a case that the implementation of one affects the effectiveness or efficacy of another one, or rather combined, this could make tax systems more progressive. What, what, what is your stance in terms of the combination of, of different taxes yeah, thanks for the question. Um, um, I, yeah, I think there might be two answers. The first one is absolutely having all these taxes is piling up together, like having a wealth tax, a better inheritance tax, uh, capital gain tax. They will make the system certainly more progressive. Um, so that's the first question, the first answer. To the question whether these are complementary or whether they are not complementary, that might depend on how do we coordinate the tax basis among all these taxes. Oh, I give you an example. Like let's we, let's say that you sell an asset. I mean, we sell an asset. On on selling an asset, you realize again we will have to pay taxes on capital gains. Is that same gain also to be included in a wealth tax? So. Because if we do, that could be a double taxation. And it's the same for the inheritance tax and wealth tax. When someone dies, the estate, the asset value they pass on, passes on, pays an inheritance tax, assuming uh, uh, the tax rates apply. Um, are we going to be, are, are we going to subject those same assets also every year to a wealth tax, the same assets that one day will pay an inheritance tax? 
it's not surprising that, for example, that a country like Norway has a wealth tax, but has no inheritance tax. So in theory, it's possible, but that requires uh, taxable, the tax basis to be highly coordinated among each other. And, and, to con and, and also to conclude the next, so to coordinating this, this tax basis is, is, is obviously a technical point, a technical issue that requires political support. And, but that there is also, um, there is also the issue on whether there might be, when it comes, for example, to wealth tax, whether there might be constitutional constraints. I'll give you the example of the United States of America. There is now a tax case, which is known as Moore case, which will be decided by the US Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. by early summer. And that, that is a case on the realization requirement. Basically, you pay taxes like capital gain taxes when you realize a gain rather than on an actual basis. And uh, because a wealth tax will have to work on an actual basis. And this case, the tax more, in this case, the US Supreme Court will have to say whether the realization requirement is legally mandated under the US Constitution to have to apply any taxes at all. And if the US Supreme Court says that the realization, the realization condition is not, a, is not required under the US Constitution, you will, I mean, it would be possible for the US Congress to adopt a wealth tax in the US. But if the US Supreme Court says on the other side, no, the realization requirement is indeed a constitutional requirement under the US Constitution, it basically would be impossible for any US Congress in the near future to ever adopt any wealth tax, at least until, until the composition of this US Supreme Court will change of, I mean, after the next decade. So like there are technical questions, political issues, and also potential constitutional constraints in having all these taxes together. So. It's not easy, I mean, but it's not easy, but because the tax word is not easy, I would say. Thank you very much, Domenico. And final question before getting to questions to the public. So the, we have spoken about uh, approaches at the national level, approaches at the international level. I, 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 I kind of sense with internal conversations with different views, some think that the, the way is through the national level uh, because of pragmatism, because of uh, political advantage, but some others think that the approach of the international level, or at least a regional level, an intermediate step, would also be a, a big push for, for implementation of wealth taxation. Alison, what, what, what's your take in, in this? Uh, thanks a lot. I think that's a very, very good question because it also reveals one big, big shortage or limitation of the study we are doing here. I really like to have these numbers because I think it's nice and you can do them per country and it might be useful and I'm always very surprised how much money it is and that all these resources are there. But, and that's a very big but, I was talking about inequalities and what we are not addressing here, once we are doing this on a national level, like every country can, can tax the billionaires or the millionaires in their own jurisdiction or those which have their residency there, residents there, um, this really does not address the huge level of cross-country wealth inequalities. And this is even more important because the levels of wealth we are talking about here, these are not national, this is not wealth which is generated on a national level, this is transnational wealth. So if you take Jeff Bezos, for instance, he, he has not generated his wealth because the education system in the US is so great and he made all this wealth there. He has generated the wealth because of having workers all over the round, uh, all, all over the world who are working for this wealth, of having people who are buying these products and are generating this wealth. So actually, we have a situation there where we would actually want to kind of tax this wealth, not only on a national level. This means we need to have some, some global coordination. And I will start with the European level now, just because it's easier, I think. I think on the European level, we could just say, let's tax them on a European level because then we can actually tax them and we can just use that as a European budget and use it where it's most needed. So we would also have the tax income which we get from billionaires in Germany in other countries which might have fewer billionaires. This is also of course useful because it makes enforcement easier and it does not allow individuals to relocate that easily. 
However, this gets more complicated once we get to the global level. For the global level, of course, and the first idea we could think, think about something which Gabriel Sukman has suggested this morning. We just say, okay, let's just tax all billionaires around the globe. We could do that in general. Yes, we would generate a lot. This has been presented this morning. But we would, should really take care of how exactly we design that. Because if we say we tax the billionaires, but then we tax them or we allow those countries to tax them where they have their residence, then this is not a super useful tax for the biggest part of the world. Because this revenue will go to the US, this revenue will go to the European Union, basically. For instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are only 11 billionaires. So this kind of tax would be super nice, but we would need to have a system where also the tax revenues go where we need them. And I think it's also quite a risk that we generate something like Pillar 3, similar to Pillar 2, where we have something which we want, but then all the revenues are just going to the countries which need it least and which also do not have the right to tax all of this because this wealth, again, was not generated in the countries of residence. Yes, thank, thank you. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry that the yeah, timekeepers yeah. are pressuring me because, of course, we want also to hear uh, the questions from the public. I think that... I think that they're going to charge us for the word, uh, for the burden. I think that we are zero. <laughs> no, but okay, I see Madame over there, Messias over here. Uh, so one, two, three, four questions. Maybe take around the four and then go ahead. Okay, I didn't think I was gonna start. So I actually have two questions. Uh, one for Martina. I, you said the exact opposite of what I was saying earlier. So I'm curious about that. I'm curious, uh, how do you jump from the fact that the, that why shouldn't we use also their narrative? I understand the, the, the problems with that, but is this something that is valid for all around the world or are there political contexts where we could use both narratives. This is about social justice and also this is good for growth. What is the danger on that? And then just one point, and it's about what was just being said. I think one thing that is important for us to think as well, there is this idea that the, the welfare state, if the welfare state of the EU has brought up these billionaires that they should give back to the European Union. And I think if we take colonialism into account, I, I think the global south has been providing the possibilities for that. So it's not only that this is more needed on the global south, I also think this is, this is owned to the global south. So just in the matter of narrative as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, Pierre Collor from uh, UNCTAD in Geneva. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I found them very interesting. And um, I wanted to make a link a bit with what Tove said this morning about, you know, what would be the purpose of this uh, UN tax convention? I mean, it's, it's an important point to know exactly what, what, do, what does this movement want, want to achieve? Is it only about uh, tax justice? Or is it also possible to uh, create uh, synergies with uh, to promote speak, the speak up a little bit? Sorry, is it also is it, is this uh, the movement you know pushing behind this UN tax convention only fighting for tax justice, or is it also concerned with uh, the green transition or, or climate? Uh, there is a panel tomorrow which we may talk about this, and um, because we know that. Inequality is also related to uh, carbon budgets, right, and uh, to, to emissions. We know the wealthy are not just wealthier, they also emit much more. So there might be a link between the tax agenda and uh, the, the climate agenda, which uh, it, I think it might be uh, important to, to, to think about it in the process of uh, defining all the, the ideas that will be uh, uh, set in, in the terms of reference, uh, for instance, and uh, in the protocols later on. Um, and th there might be um, a tension between the global south and the global north here, uh, because, I mean, as we have heard, uh, the African group was very important in 
supporting politically the, the tax justice agenda and uh, they are very concerned about investment and development and rightfully so, right? <laughs> Uh, but in the north, uh, we have a different problem, and um, which is over emissions, right? I mean, we, we know we are all above <laughs> our, our fair budget of emissions. And um, so I think it's, it's not easy to conciliate these, uh, these tensions in, in a coherent narrative, you know, that would uh, push forward simultaneously the interests of, of the global south and those of the of, of the north in, in leading the, the green transition. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think that we we have another question. We do a round and an, another round of, of questions. Um, we, we finish. Uh, Ross, I think it was. Oh, sorry, I I didn't see the other one. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rose Saubrink. I work with ActionAid, and uh, thank you very much for. Could you speak a little bit louder, yes, please? Yes. Sorry. Um, hi, my name is Rose Saubrink. I work with ActionAid International. Um, thank you for this panel and for this day. A lot has been discussed. And I'm really glad that um, you mentioned the uh, IMF today in your presentation and the, the disproportionate voting power there as well. Um, I, I think uh, it is one of the institutions that is also perpetuating a lot of these tax um, uh, structures that are so harmful. Um, you know, several <laughs> IMF papers have been quoted. Um, and I just wanted to uh, to also respond to uh, our colleague from UNCTAD here that actually, yes, there are differences there between the global north and the global south, but as uh, uh, for those who saw the film yesterday has already been pointed out very well is that the inequality levels and the uh, lack of growth in, in um, wages uh, uh, are so stark across, uh, across the whole world um, that I think that's the narrative uh, uh, that uh, we need to go with, also to counter um, the increasing right-wing right um, authoritarianism in, in Europe. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I was interested to hear your thoughts on um, uh, 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 for the several panelists around um, uh, gender equality and um, uh, racism in, in this narrative and where you see that taking place, because in my view, it's, it's a part of the global narrative, but also on a national level. And so uh, where you're focusing uh, on your geographical area, I'd be interested to understand if you feel this is a part of the narrative as well as, as a broader discussion on justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. So let's come back to some answers. So we have here for Martina, the use of the narratives, their narratives, neoliberalism narratives, uh, also kind of narratives around gender and, and racism, but at the same time also for, for, for everyone, how, how to, to put also these intersectionalities in the work of uh, around world taxation, and finally, maybe someone you want, wants to 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 chip in into the tax justice and tran green transition, the connection there is uh, over there. Yes, thank you very much. I also realized that uh, we are on different pages, <laughs> to put it bluntly, and um, what I really really think is that taking a look on neoliberal narratives and take them and just try to actually use them in favor of, of our new narratives and of our new paradigm is just not working. Why not? In the first place, because it's wrong. Um, if you take a look on, on scientific findings, we see that, and Hope and Lemberg uh, published a beautiful paper on that, where they were looking on 18 OECD countries, and I know we are not speaking only about OECD, we should not, but this is a beautiful example. So they are taking into account 18 OECD countries over the last 50 years, and what happens actually if we follow the neoliberal idea of bringing down taxes, because then we will all of a sudden have economic growth and more jobs. And what they show is that for all these countries, it's just not true, it's an anomaly. So we have neither economic growth nor did we produce any further jobs. It's just a myth. And I think in, uh, in the first place, we should see and understand our job in showing now how much bullshit is out there if we talk about neoliberalism in the first place and just show it's not true. It's not true in the empirical stand, but also then if you take the epistemological, so what methods, what theories do we use actually, we see neoliberalism in general is just not working. We need a new paradigm. Second, 
I mean, I, I was looking over the narratives over the last century on inheritance tax, and I saw also groups of trying to strengthen the inheritance tax and to exactly apply those neoliberal narratives, and it just did not work. In the times in both Mexico and Germany when it worked, it was when they used bigger narratives, not jobs and not economic growth, but really justice, democracy, and reducing inequality. And these are just the lessons from the last 100 years. Nowadays, we have even bigger challenges. We have climate justice, which we also have to bring in. I, I'm, I'm really um, really sure that we should also take take this stand, see whose responsibility is it actually that our, uh, that our planet is building. So like simply have like really big narratives, democracy, justice, inequality, climate, and not jobs. Um, and uh, third, if we take a look on the discourse in general on tax justice and inequality, inequality is quite new in the debate. It's quite a new player in this entire game. I mean, we have a couple in the 21st century from 2014. We have the SDG number 10 reducing inequality from 2015. It's super new, but what it shows us is that it's not all about just poverty and then jobs. We have to look up. We have to look on the rich, on the over-rich, as Martin Schurz, he's an Austrian economist, tells us, we have to make the rich the problem and not only the poverty in order to look for solutions. And this also brings me then to intersectionality and all the other problems. If we look on all these dimensions of social inequalities to bring them in, we will not do that just only by jobs, also for sure. And I will not say that we should not talk about it. But if we take a look on which ones, repertoires of narratives, sorry, were uh, most efficient, these were the narrower ones. And that would ra rather go um, also towards like questions of big justice questions, gender, climate, democracy, rather than, um, yeah, on the smaller ones, on the, especially on the neoliberal ones that are bullshit. So I would just quickly comment on the comment which was made. So thank you so much for the comment, because I think this is very, very relevant. And I think we really need to realize that these extreme wealth levels, I think we can discuss about usual property, but these extreme wealth levels are a result of exploitation. They are a result of exploitation of the planet, of people. They are a result of colonialism and post-colonial structures. So, so this is exactly why it's so important that we find a way of, of having um, source taxing rights such that also all who contributed voluntarily or involuntarily actually benefit from it. And not because, like you said, that's very relevant, not because they need it more, but also because they, they own it. Um, and yes, this could, I think, also be part of, of a model net wealth tax, which could be discussed uh, by, the, by the UN Tax Committee or the subcommittee, which is relevant there. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take another round of questions, the final round. I, I had... <laughs> okay, no, I think that we, 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 we have no time. So maybe I'm going to ask, uh, the, yeah, going to ask the, the panelists maybe a final remark very quickly. And sorry if I know there were a lot of questions. Hopefully you could approach the, the panelists and, and, and discuss a little bit more in the cocktail. Just briefly, because we're over time, but I think uh, for me, the main issues uh, were only in favor of redistributing wealth across and within countries. So we need to build institutions that ensure that the uh, less advantages actually receive that wealth. And that's what I was trying to expose in the last slide that we need the international governments that ensure that the poor countries in Saharan Africa and Latin America and all over the world actually get the, the wealth that we are taxing in the rich countries and that, it, with, that this wealth that we tax in the rich countries doesn't stay there because if not, problems will continue, I will need to address this in a different conference. Yeah, I would just in the first place say thank you to all of you because I, I am so grateful and happy to see so many people working on real on the big issues of tax justice. And uh, I really would like us all to be on the same page and to focus really on the problems we have, which is over wealth, <laughs> which is like really questions of democracy and of climate. And I'm really looking forward to the to the next years. And uh, it must start somewhere here. It must start sometime. It does. Thank you. These were perfect last words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much.
I'd like to thank our moderator and speakers one more time. I also want to quickly thank all the folks working behind the scenes to make all this Zoom magic happen. Um, our next session, our closing remarks, um, will be over Zoom. So um, I'd like to thank you, uh, ask you all to join me in welcoming Lucas Chancel from the World Inequality Lab. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, so I'm delighted to um, to be closing this uh, this first day of uh, of conference, and um, I wanted to say on behalf of the World Inequality Lab um, how um, delighted and happy we were to to be partnering with uh, this um, um, great network of actors uh, that have been uh, working hard to organize this conference. So. Uh, I wanted to say start by saying a few thank, thank you words to uh, our ICRIC colleagues, so Tommaso Faccio, Alejandro Olac, Diego Luma, to our tax just ne justice net network colleagues, including indeed Alex Cobham, Mark Metzor, Elena Rose, uh, Joan Jones, Luke Holland, the Eurodad network as well with Tove Maria and uh, the, Euro, uh, the EU tax observatory indeed with Quentin Parinello and Inga. Um, I think what one thing that unites all these institutions, and I am sure all those who are in this um, room today, is the idea that we need to bridge the gap between research and policy in order to make um, an improvement to the current state of things when it comes to tax matters. And I think that is precisely what is happening in such conferences with such a gathering of diverse network of actors, researchers, practitioners, um, lawyers, policymakers, um, activists. And I think this really shows and tells us about the, the success of, of, of that kind of, uh, of conference. Um, then I wanted to um, say basically three things, and I'll try to be brief, as I know it's, uh, it's the end of the day and, and we're already a little bit over time. So I, I'll try to, to keep my closing remarks uh, pretty short. Um, first, I wanted to say just a few words about the background leading to the tax discussion that we're currently having. And just wanted to um, talk about the global inequality and in particular, the global wealth inequality picture here. Then um, I will say again, just a few words about the very specific moment we are in and the window of opportunity that is uh, opening to us all right now, whether to us as researchers, as um, practitioners, as tax experts, as um, or uh, as NGO uh, leaders. And then, and I will conclude on this, the third point will be about um, we're still, you know, quite far from uh, um, moving towards a uh, UN tax convention, even though there's this window of opportunity, which I think we all um, see and observe, uh, but we also already need to think ahead. We also already need to think right now about the next steps, and I will conclude on that. On the first point, the background, let me just share um, just for uh, a few seconds, two graphs from the, the work of the World uh, Inequality Lab, which was summarized in our latest World Inequality Report. And you can find even more up-to-date data online. Uh, we've just updated our um, global inequality series. But the general numbers are uh, all about the same in, in our latest data in 22, 2023. And so this is the general global inequality picture with the top 10% of the world population making about 52% of um, global income and the top 10% of the world population ranked by wealth making about three quarters of um, uh, all the wealth there is to own with the bottom half of the population owning just 2% of the total. So the background to the discussion about tax justice is indeed this huge uh, sustained global inequality. This global inequality 
I'm sure this is not a novelty to anybody in this room, is true at the global level, but it is also true within regions and within countries as well. And I think this is going to connect with the uh, European theme of, uh, of this, uh, or at least of part of this conference. Um, so Europe, uh, from uh, many perspectives, is a relatively good player uh, in the global framework from the uh, global point of view when it comes to inequality. And this is true, European inequality levels are relatively lower than in the rest of the world, but actually the trends are not looking so good. And when we move from income to wealth and we look at wealth inequality levels, even in Europe, the situation is extremely uh, striking with the bottom half of the population owning less than 5% of the total. So yes, there are regions where wealth inequality is actually even higher, Middle East, North Africa, on the right-hand side of my graph here, Russia, Central Asia, where the top 10% make more than 70% uh, of all uh, wealth. So you have regions where the inequality level is about as high as in the world as a whole. So these are regions where you really have these, these huge divides, which are really similar to what you can observe in the world as a whole. But here, the point that I'm trying to make is that even in Europe, which sometimes looks at the rest of the world saying, okay, just copy us and you'll be good. Even in Europe, there's still quite a bit of work to be done, especially when we look at wealth inequality. And that is, I think, what this graph here tells us. So as we all know, tax progressivity, uh, fixing the tax systems is essential in um, uh, moving towards more uh, um, equal distributions of income and wealth. Gabriel Zuckman presented a series of concrete proposals to go in this direction uh, earlier today. I just wanted to show you uh, one of the many tools that we propose at the World Inequality Lab to anybody interested in those topics. Uh, one of the many many tools we propose online. So this is a global wealth tax simulator where if you go to this link, you will be able to pick any region in the world or pick the world as a whole and input your preferred wealth, uh, personal wealth tax with the rates you want. And you will be able to see, you can also play around with different parameters with respect to depreciation or tax evasion, and you will see the potential tax revenues this shows. So I just wanted here to um, um, showcase some of the some of the work that we've been doing at the World Inequality Lab to try to be, to, to build this this um, a collective understanding of the landscape. And um, and there are many more tools that uh, we invite you to to look at on uh, the World Inequality Lab's website as well as on the uh, website of uh, all the partners. Uh, that uh, have been co-organizing co this 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 great event. Um, so the second point is is a few words on the specific moment we're in. Um, this uh, uh, this specific moment is is one where I think there's also a shared understanding of a window of opportunity of a once in a century momentum uh, that we as a tax community have two sides. Um, so earlier today, as I was just referring to, some concrete proposals were made. Uh, Gabriel Zuckman the, and the EU Tax Observatory have been asked to present proposals in the context of the G20. So this is, again, a very uh, specific uh, uh, political opportunity to be sides. Um, but in fact, many dots might be aligned at the moment. So, our understand as a diverse community here is to understand how to make use of this unique moment. And here I'd like to maybe pause uh, and say a few words about uh, the latest um, perspective brought to us by uh, the uh, US administration. So uh, in the recent state uh, of the union address for those of you who may have missed it, uh, President Biden said uh, a few interesting and important things about corporate and personal wealth taxation, which, from my perspective, reinforced this message of a window of opportunity by uh, showing that 
the currently agreed set of rules in the context of the Global Minimum Tax Agreement are not set in stone. These can evolve. Discussion will continue about the rates, about the actual me underlying mechanisms, about the uh, actual underlying uh, set of uh, laws and uh, coding mechanisms to make this uh, uh, um, practical and implementable within jurisdictions. So maybe two things here that um, come from the, the latest US discussion is uh, this increase in the uh, corporate min minimum tax in the US. Uh, so uh, President Biden mentioned a, a global minimum tax on foreign earnings at 21%. So that's higher than the 15% minimum tax. Um, it's still unclear how the US positions itself with the uh, a global agreement. As you know, the minimum tax of the US, which was introduced by the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, is set as 15% of fiscal income reported by shareholders. This is not the same thing as the global 15% minimum tax on global um, incomes, but we see that uh, things aren't stopping at where they at, are at. And the positive view that many of us had or the optimistic view was that, okay, let's start with 15% and this will kickstart a series of discussions and renegotiations to move forward. This is actually what is happening right now. Of course, of course, we don't know uh, what will be the outcome of the presidential elections in the US in a few months, but things are not set in stone. Um, at the national level, so the corporate tax in the U.S. is uh, proposed to be increased from 21% to 28%, so a strong reversal as compared to uh, the uh, tax breaks uh, and the rates reductions under, an, under the previous um, administration. And now comes the other topic, the increased tax rates on individual billionaires with uh, uh, the, 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 the current U.S. president and, and uh, candidate for, for, the, for re election stressing this, this 25% tax uh, uh, of billionaires as a share, minimum tax as a share of their income. So we see that uh, things are not set in stone. It is, it is actual time. It is actually time to think about in which framework do we want these, this new set of negotiations to take place, this new set of reflections to uh, take place? And my third point now would be to, to, to argue that uh, European countries and the European Union actually have a strategic interest to uh, do these discussions in the context of the UN uh, TAC convention framework. Uh, one reason here indeed is that uh, there are huge criticisms about uh, Western countries and Europeans' geopolitical hypocrisy and double standards. And frankly speaking, very often the entire world sees it, uh, except for uh, Western uh, leaders. These criticisms are uh, actually damaging Europe's interest and reinforces the interest of Europe's strategic partners. So. Uh, agreeing to a UN tax convention could help change this. This would be indeed far from sufficient, but given the importance of the tax matter, given the importance of uh, this um, revised set of rules for the global economic systems, um, it um, adhering to a UN tax convention would arguably, arguably be um, a necessary piece of the puzzle to reset relations between the global north and the global south. I think another important uh, uh, piece of the argumentation here uh, is that uh, for European countries, uh, it is not possible anymore to count only uh, on their bilateral relationship with the US. We see this in other domains, military domains, for instance, but this is also going to be the case in tax and economic matters. Um, so it's important for Europe to think more broadly, to think more globally. And of course, the United Nations is in a very difficult position right now. Um, but I think it's also important for European countries to realize that the collapse of this institution, which unfortunately is not 
you know, entirely um, something that is impossible to conceive anymore. The collapse of this institution will also be detrimental to the worldview and the vision uh, promoted by European countries. So strengthening it goes in the right direction. A UN tax convention would go in this direction. And again, here, I think it is in European countries' strategic interest to move forward through this uh, channel of discussions of negotiations uh, in, the, in the coming months, in the coming years, when it comes to tax matters. And the third point and final point here. So I started with the, the background, then I moved on to the, this window of opportunity and why there was a strategic interest for uh, Western countries and in particular European countries uh, to move through a UN tax convention. The third point is thinking ahead. I think it's important um, um, and we here need to uh, recognize that things will still be harsh, complicated. The road will be long towards a new uh, a commonly agreed set of rules on corporations and uh, to tax corporations and individuals, um, rules that are more ambitious than the current uh, minimum uh, that have been agreed on. Um, but we also need to start at the same time to think about how the revenues from these taxes should be used. Um, and for sure, countries are likely to want to use new sources of revenues for themselves. And this is, I think, one of the ways why you know, these calls for increased taxes on the wealthy and multinationals are working, because of policymakers see domestic gains. Uh, uh, they, they see some political uh, advantages to doing this. Here, it's important to convince public opinion that these new revenues uh, um, there is an interest to invest them in global public good. And actually, research carried out by some colleagues here at the Paris School of Economics suggests that there is broad support for wealth taxes that would be used to finance uh, climate funds. And uh, this indeed raises many questions about how to collect, how to distribute, how to monitor such uh, funds and such transfers. And this is what we really need to start to make progress on and additional research is, is being carry, carried out on this as uh, we speak uh, today. Uh, part of, the, of this money um, arguably should indeed be dedicated, invested in uh, closing the huge climate finance gap. And uh, there will be a session tomorrow about this um, issue and also how taxes and tax rates could actually be also uh, uh, set in a way that uh, they incorporate some carbon component. And so this will be uh, one of the sessions from tomorrow morning with colleagues presenting on that. Um, so all this work needs to be amplified. Uh, all this work uh, needs to be continued. And it really looks like, um, at least for many of us, the UN would indeed, indeed be a particularly relevant institution to, um, uh, to coordinate uh, the efforts uh, when it comes to uh, uh, collecting money and redistributing it. But of course, uh, other institutions, development banks, uh, national uh, or uh, other international organizations might have their role, might have their, uh, uh, their word to say here. And this is precisely what I'm trying to, to talk about when I say it is actually time to think about how this money should be used and the precise set of institutions and mechanisms uh, to collect and to redistribute some of these funds. So to conclude, I think these are very exciting times for the uh, uh, tax community. And I wish us all to live up to this uh, challenge. And again, on behalf of the World Inequality Lab and our co-organizers, I would like to thank you again for 
uh, your participation in this conference and all the inputs that you've been uh, providing. Thank you again uh, so very much. Thank you.